I can say a few words and then we'll get started on that. Take it away, Ali. Thank you. Hi guys, I'm um, Ali, I'm coming in from uh, Coinbase Recruiting, um, but I would really like to introduce you to my friend Tiago here, who um, is on the more Europe side. Hello everyone. Uh, so yeah, quick introduction, Tiago, uh, sitting in the recruitment team here in London and leading the expansion for engineering hiring across uh, UK and Ireland. Uh, yeah, Coinbase is at hyper growth at the moment, so we're going to be looking in terms of hiring loads of people. The international expansion plan is quite, uh, quite strong, so we have a to hire over 200 engineers across all levels and generations. Uh, here in either UK and Ireland, and then further down the line in more European countries as we continue to expand. Um, we're going to be at the conference as well on Thursday and Friday, so if you have any questions either after the talk or during the Thursday Friday, the conference will be there and happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Are you hiring lightning engineers? Oh. Are you hiring lightning engineers? Yes, as well. Sure are. Cool. Yeah. And I have one more friend. <laughs> and hi, I'm Trent from Coinbase Giving. Um, so we have developer grants available for people in the community doing uh, Bitcoin Core Developer or any other sort of work, uh, blockchain agnostic. We've got four themes. You can read more about them by grabbing one of these uh, flyers over here. It's a QR code that leads to our application. Um, so if you're looking for you know money to do some core development, please apply to us. If you're looking for a full-time gig, please apply to us. If you just want to enjoy the drink and food, enjoy it. Yeah. Woo! Well, thank you guys. Thank you. <laughs> oh, you want it all. Okay. Okay. Um, so, should we start with the demo? Sure. Uh, and then we'll crack on the panel. So, uh, Christian is going to demo Greenlight, as far as I know, exclusively. Yeah, this, this is about the first time that anybody has seen it. Um, it's also kind of ad hoc, so I can't guarantee it's working. It's also not going to look very nice. Though I heard you're all developers, so you can see. Box you, you can do <laughs> <laughs> I suck at interfaces, so that's just to prove it. Um, can we maybe get the lights out of it so it's more clear on the screen? Or is Zoom! It? I was actually hoping to skip the demo completely, and, but uh, Michael was forcing me to do it, so uh, let, let's see how this goes. Can you just magnify it? Sure, magnify it works. So, um, Basically, for, for those who have never heard about Greenlight, it's an attempt from us. Is this better somehow? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. It, it is a service that we uh, that we hope to be offering uh, very soon to uh, to end users uh, who might not yet know uh, what uh, what operating a Lightning node looks like, but who would like to dip their toes into it and sort of get a feel of what Lightning can do for you before investing the time to actually learn and upgrade your uh, your own experience. Um, so this is not intended for routing nodes. This is not intended for you if you basically know how to run a lightning node. This is for you if you want to see what it can do for you, but, uh, but are not prepared to do the, uh, the investment just yet. Um, the, uh, the way that it works is basically that uh, we run the infrastructure on your behalf, but we don't have access to your keys. The keys that are necessary to basically sign off on, uh, on anything that, uh, that would move funds. So what we call it is a, it's a hosted, non-custodial uh, lightning as a service, uh, li lightning as a service service. Uh, <laughs> did I mention this is a bot? Um, so I will walk you through quickly uh, of uh, how you can get a node, get it up and running, and interact with it, and do a payment with it. Uh, and it's going to be from a command line, which I know all of you will appreciate. Um, hopefully, eventually, we will actually have a, a UI for this. Um, so as you can see, this is pretty much uh, an empty directory. Uh, so what I can do is, typing with one hand is always hard. Um,
what I do is I I want to register a node, uh, let's say for uh, typing is hard uh, for the mainnet. So uh, we register a node for uh, for mainnet. What this does is actually it goes out, talks to our service, uh, allocates a, a, a node for you, and it will give you back uh, the um, uh, the X credentials to actually talk to it. So now what we have here is uh, is basically we have the uh, the uh, the seed phrase that uh, was generated locally. We will never share this with anybody. Uh, it will never leave this device at all. Um, and we have the credentials here. What we do next is basically we ask it, okay, where, where is it running? Uh, well, the node with this ID is currently not running anywhere. Well, let's change that. Uh, so what I do is now I, uh, I tell the, let me give it a couple of lines. This way. Uh, so, so what I do now is I tell it to spin up this node. I want to uh, I want to actually use it and talk to it. So I talk to the scheduler, and after a two second break, it will tell me, "Hey, your node is running here." Now what I can do is I can actually talk to it. So when I now call get info, it will talk to this node and say, "Hey, I am node violent chaser uh, with this ID uh, running this version." And I'm synchronized at this block height. My code, um, hold the mic closer. Okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'll, I'll do that on my own. Yes. <laughs> so um, we, we can we can actually tail the logs and we can interact with it and we have a whole bunch of uh, uh, of useful command line tools that we can actually do with it. So we can open channels, we can disconnect, we can stop it if we ever want that. Um, we can generate a new address and stuff like that. So that's kind of cute, but um, it's not helping as much, right? Uh, so what I did before, as in every cooking show you've ever seen, I prepared something. <laughs> um, so what we have here is uh, we have this node that I set up a couple of days, uh, days ago. It's called T2, very imaginative. And uh, when, we, um, when we go and say, hey, I'd like to, uh, I'd like to talk to this guy, this is actually going out to the scheduler, starting it, and talking to the node, and, uh, and getting the uh, get info. So this is vital seagull. And if we, uh, uh, if we check what, uh, where it's connected to using list peers, we see, oh, it has a connection, but it's disconnected. So what we can do now is we can basically start Here, what we uh, what we've just done is we have connected the signer to the node, we've connected the front end to the node, and now this node is fully functional. It has reconnected to its peer, and it could perform payments. So what we uh, what we can do here is list peers again, and we see that well, we can't see because the screen is too big. It's connected. It's actually talking to a node, and it's up to date. So now I go over to my favorite demo uh, shop by our <laughs> friends of Eclair. Um, this is actually the best way to demonstrate anything on testing, by the way. Um, and buying coffee has always been my go-to example. So I create a lightning invoice, and I copy this invoice, and I pay it. So let me just put this side by side so we can actually see what's happening here. And it works. And now I can uh, breathe a sigh of. Uh, <laughs> this this is always scary. So what what just happened here? Uh, so this machine acted both as a signer. It held on to the to the private keys, and it acted as a front end. Uh, the node itself did not have any control over uh, over what happened. The front end was sending authenticated commands to the node. The node was computing what the change should be in the channels. And to actually effect those changes, sorry, kind of march, um, march. Um, 
the, um, we, we actually had to reach out to the signing, uh, to the signer to verify, sign off on changes, and send back the signatures. And uh, if you, you might have seen this scroll by very quickly, um, where is it? So what it did here is basically it, uh, the, the signer received incoming signature requests, signed them, and sent them back. Um, so this basically allows you to spin up a node in less than a second. Uh, when you need it, you open the app, it will spin up the node again, it will connect, it will do everything uh, uh, automatically, and you can just use it as if it were any app you would normally use. Uh, what does this for web app, de uh, for app developers? Well, you don't actually have to learn how to operate lightning nodes anymore because we do it for you. Um, what does this mean for, uh, for end users? Well, you don't have to learn about how to, uh, how to operate a lightning node anymore uh, before seeing what you could do with a lightning node. You first see what, how, what the upside is, and then we give you the tools to actually learn and, and up to, uh, upgrade your experience, and eventually we want you to basically take your node and take self-custody of it now that you're a fully self-sovereign individual, you're a fully self-sovereign node operator in the Lightning Network. Um, this is our uh, attempt to onboard, educate, and then offboard. So, yeah, that's, that's pretty much it. Um, I hope this is something that you find interesting, and it's uh, certainly something that we will have many, many more updates uh, coming soon. And we will have some sexier interfaces as well. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And now I can actually tell you what the scary part about this demo is. My battery is so dead that I didn't know if it would survive these five minutes. <laughs> cool. So the way this is going to work today is that like, we'll have topics and we'll open it up to questions on each topic. Uh, so the topic now is green light. If anyone has any questions or comments on green light, yep. sure. yes, is there a reason? Is there a reason for a business to, to not use this long term? I mean, um, um, so the way we achieve efficiency with this is that if you're not using the node, we will spin it down because we well we can't do any changes, so we will spin it down and you uh, free those resources and use it for other users. Um, if you are online continuously and basically make use of it and, and keep it alive, then we currently impose a one hour limit to that, but we could lift that for you as a business. Ultimately, we don't, if you're a business, you're probably better off running your own node, and you probably don't want to run this anyway, uh, because you want to have more control over, uh, over your device. This is mainly for onboarding new users, teaching them how things could look like before they, they have to make any investment. But we don't actually prevent you from using it if you want to have a business on it. So one of the use cases that I, uh, I can imagine is, for example, you're at a hackathon, uh, you just need a quick lightning backend, right? Well, it takes less than a second to spin this up and sort of have, a, have an experimental backend for the weekend and once you uh, once you see that it uh, that it's working, we will uh, we will allow you to export the node and make it a fully fledged lightning node in your own infrastructure that you fully control as well. I think it was. <laughs> oh, a few. Oh, <laughs> um, is Greenlight itself open source so other people can run the service? Uh, yes. So uh, we plan to open source many many parts of uh, of Greenlight among which is the, uh, the networking interface, which I know is, a, is an old uh, friend of yours, uh, complaining about the lack of network RPC and C-Lightning. Um, and uh, we, uh, we will open source the components that allow you to basically run the nodes themselves on your infrastructure. Uh, what we're still considering whether we want to open source this uh, is the control plane, basically how you register a node and how you schedule a node. Um, but that might also be an option because we want as many of these offerings as possible to help uh, to, to basically uh, help as many people 
onboard into the Lightning Network as possible. Um, will blockchain be implementing this in their own front ends or like uh, Green Wallet or things like this? And, and if so, what flat library and languages will that be? So uh, we currently offer, so the, um, the way we interact with the nodes is basically just a gRPC interface. Uh, so any language that can talk to your PC can basically interact with this, uh, with this, uh, with the nodes running on uh, on our services. And uh, yes, the goal is effectively to uh, to integrate this with. Okay, screensaver. <laughs> uh, 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 yes, the, the goal is to eventually integrate it into Green. Um, we didn't want to sort of force the Green team to basically spend time on on this. Uh, as of yet, because they tend to be uh, quite busy. Um, so we are making this, uh, we are working with a couple of uh, companies in a closed beta right now uh, to explore how to make this, uh, how to get uh, get Lightning integrations into as many applications as possible. But yes, the, the name Greenlight is basically the giveaway here that it is planned for green, I guess. <laughs> well, we'll have two more questions. We can't have Greenlight the whole time. So yeah, just, just one quick question. Oh, I, I, I can talk really like the whole night. <laughs> 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 so how are you managing the liquidity per user? And then also, what does that look like? You mentioned being able to export from it yeah. and then on your own. So the liquidity per user, and then what does that look like in an export scenario? Uh, yeah, so uh, the uh, liquidity is basically a handle by us uh, coordinating with external uh, liquidity service providers to make sure that you as the end user have the uh, cheapest and best possible offer you could have to open channels to the wider network. Um, and we plan to sort of have, uh, have a, uh, a lower bound uh, offering by ourselves as well, just to make sure that every user that wants liquidity can get it. And uh, for the export, uh, this is running uh, open source sea lightning. Um, so what we, uh, what we do with, uh, with the export is basically we give you a copy of the database mark the node as exported in our own database so that we don't start it again. And you can import the database into your own node, uh, which means that you don't have any downtime, uh, you don't have to close channels, you don't have to reopen channels. Your, uh, your node will be exactly as is uh, the, uh, at the moment that you export it. Uh, we also plan to offer a couple of uh, uh, integration uh, helpers, um, such as a reverse proxy, giving node a, uh, a, uh, its own URL, so that if you have any wallet attached to your node, it will still be able to talk to the node even if you offboard it into your own self-hosted infrastructure, making it basically a zero, uh, zero config change for, uh, for front end. Cool. I think so too. On demo, actually, um, I saw a hyper -term secret there. So yeah, are you actually like connected to a hardware module, or um, is it just like a soft signing? That, that that name has always been a bit aspirational, <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> right. Um, but yes. Uh, so the um, we we will take the learnings from this to inform also the the way that we that the open source lightning uh, project will be uh, will be designed going forward. So we will use information that we gathered from this to make sea lightning more efficient in the future. And part of that is also the way that we ver uh, that we independently verify in the signer uh, uh, whether it's, uh, it's an authenticated command or not. Uh, that will eventually inform uh, how we can build hardware security modules, including uh, hardware wallets for lightning nodes themselves. So this is very much a learning experience for us uh, to eventually get you a Ledger or a Trezor that can run uh, that can be used to run a Lightning node as well. Um, right. So you could actually sort of also just expand the HWI uh, library, perhaps. Uh, the HWI might not be sufficient in this case for for us. So yeah, it, it would require quite a bit more uh, state management on the hardware itself uh, to actually get this uh, get this working in a reliable way and make sure that we can verify the full context of, of whatever we're signing on. Yeah. Did you have a question, Mark? Uh, before we ask, okay. Okay. Excellent. Thank you very much.
Cool, so it's not time. a lot of familiar faces, like for anybody who's new to the Lightning Network, I'll just give the basics. Um, so Lightning Network is a network built on top of uh, the Bitcoin network, it allows for lots of transaction throughput, um, it doesn't touch the chain, and there are various implementations that try to stay uh, compatible using the step process. So today we have uh, three representatives of three implementations. We have a representative of the fourth implementation at the back, so uh, for any LDK questions, we'll try and get a mic at the back. But uh, we have Christian representing Sea Lightning, uh, Bastion representing Fire, and Oliver representing LMD. So I thought to start uh, something that might be quite fun to do is a sales pitch, a short sales pitch for your implementation. And also an anti-sales pitch, like what you think your implementation is currently bad. And let's, who wants to go first? <laughs> I'll do it. So, um, C Lightning. Um, it's written in C, so very efficient. Uh, it adheres to the uh, Unix philosophy of doing one thing and one thing very well. Uh, we don't force decisions on you. But we have, uh, but C Lightning is very uh, modular and customizable, so you can actually make it very much your own, uh, however you like, however you need it to be. Shall I go with the anti pitch right away? <laughs> yep. <clears throat> C Lightning, it's very bare bones, it's missing a network uh, RPC, and you actually have to do work to get it working. <laughs> Which, I mean, it's probably a corollary of the sales pitch. <laughs> All right, so Eclair, its goal is stability, reliability, and scalability, and security as well. And yeah, it's a bit similar to Lightning here. We were not aiming for maximum number of features, and we're a bit lacking a developer community, but our goal is to have something stable that does payments right, and that scales, and you just don't have to care about your node, and it just runs, and it never crashes, and there's never any issues. And the anti pitch is that it's in Scala, so no one knows Scala, and it <laughs> scales everyone. But it's actually really great. <laughs> yeah, so uh, LMD tries to be um, developer first, so we want that uh, developers can pick it up easily, can integrate it into their product, build apps on top of it, um, and then distribute it um, as like a wallet or just a self hosted node or like bring bringing it to the plebs and we we focus um, mainly on the, the having a great uh, developer interface so we do grpc and rest and try to build in everything um, but also yeah make it secure and scalable which comes to the current main uh, um, point is if you're on a very large node then currently database size is an issue, we're working very hard on that to um, yeah, make, not make that a, a big issue, we're working on um, uh, external database support or have actually introduced that, and, uh, yeah, lots to do with that. Cool, so uh, Christian went through green light um, just there, um, perhaps Bastian you can talk about running one of the biggest, is it one of the biggest or the biggest uh, lightning node on the network? Depends on um, what you count, but yeah, I'd say probably the biggest. Okay. Um, so I, I, I know that you don't intensely manage that node, but like, can you give any insights into running such a big node? I think there are scaling problems or scaling challenges that you, you can talk to me about. Please. So the main challenge is currently sleeping at night knowing that you have that many bitcoins in a hot wallet. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> apart from that, we, to be honest, we didn't have any issues scaling because there, there's not that much volume on Lightning today. We, it's really easy to, to support that volume. And we built Eclair to be easily, horizontally scalable. So one thing that we did, I think a year ago, is that right now there are, we 
Eclair is running, Arnaud is running on multiple machines. There's one main machine that does all the channel and important logic, but there are also two front-end machines that do all of the connection management, routing gossip management, some of the things that are bandwidth intensive and that can easily be scaled across many different machines because its connection is independent from other connections. And to be honest, we don't need it. It could easily run on a single machine even at our scale, but it was just a proof of concept that we can do it. And if we need to scale, it's easy to then scale these front-end machines horizontally. So that's something we're really happy with and it worked. It was a bit simpler than we expected in a way. But on the scaling issue, I think the main scaling issues is not related to lightening the implementation, but just scaling onboarding users and uh, getting many people to have channels and to run in non-custodial settings. So that's independent of the implementation and really just something about lightning as a whole. We want people to be self-sovereign and be able to use lightning without any pain points. Cool, and it's such a big node because you have the Phoenix mobile wallet um, to lots of users connecting across massive time drives. That's the reason why you have such a big node on the network. Well, we, we, had, we had the biggest node on the network even before we launched Phoenix. Mm -hmm. So, it helped. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but that's the only clear. reason. <laughs> we did have Eclair, which was like the first like proper mobile wallet, in my opinion. <laughs> yeah, but Eclair could connect to, any, to anything. Uh -huh. Yeah, you could open channels to anyone. And so then, with these different models that are emerging for running Lightning Node, but Oliver, you can talk about Lightning Node Connect, and this is this is offering like a very different service to what Greenlight and what Christian was talking about earlier. This is uh, not getting a company to do all the hard stuff. This is just allowing you to set up infrastructure between, say, two servers and splitting up the functionality of that node or that wallet. Is that right? um, Lightning Node Connect is, is a way to connect to your node from, from um, let's say, uh, even a website or from uh, a different device. So it, it helps you um, punch through your home router and uh, establish a connection and it makes it easier. Before what we had was something called LMD Connect and it uh, was a QR code and you had to do port forwarding, there was a certificate in there and the micro room and it was, it was hard to set up and um, what Lightning Node Connect is uh, trying to do is through a, an external proxy it just bridges that gap to your node so you can connect from any device to your node even if you're running behind the firewall on Tor only um, and basically it gives you a, a 10 word comparing phrase that you can then use to, to connect to your node. And the idea is that this is uh, implementation agnostic so yeah okay currently it only runs on LMD but um, it's very similar to the noise protocol. It, it's using Spake for the initial pairing. So it's, it's a secure protocol to connect to a node behind the firewall. And we want to see this being adopted by other implementations as well. So it, it could be cool for the Lightning Eclair um, to use this. It's, yeah, it, we have an early early version released. Um, needs some work, but um, if that sounds interesting, please take a look. Okay, so this is separate to the remote sign that I was kind of combining the two. But these are two separate projects, right? One's like addressing that traversal, the other one is addressing yeah, like no, private Yeah, that was or... why I wasn't sure when you yeah, yeah, yeah. this, so sorry I'm if I went on a tangent no, there, but not, yeah, right. remote signing is, is uh, different. We, um, it, it's currently just separating out the, 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 the like private key part out of the LMD node. So it, currently it's just Splitting it out, you need to run a secondary LMD, and and there's a gRPC interface in between. But now that we have the separation, we can implement actual more logic to make it, um, yeah, implement um, policies on when to sign, how how often. So it, it's just the first step. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, so topic comparison of implementations, or any particular questions on the specific implementation. We do have Antoine in the back who can answer any. LDK questions, contrasting uh -huh. LDK with these approaches. But yeah, do we have any questions on this topic? Yes. Um, does LND have plans for being able to create a similar environment screenplay where you could do 
like you were mentioning, fully remote signing, where you can it's totally segregated. Um, if you mean with an environment like a service provider, then no. Um, like we won't be offering as such a, a service compared to Greenlight because we have um, partners like Voltage that already do that. But what, uh, if you're just on the technology wise, yes, yes, and we want to be able to have a complete separation of, of private keys and um, you being able to apply policies onto how often you can sign or, or like how, yeah, how much or on what keys or whatever. So yes, that that's a plan. But us hosting a, a service, remote signing service, I, I don't think so. No. Yeah, I just more meant so like in the. I'm coming from the app user experience, so basically, so the app can just pull the keys for the user and use any remote web to be from a lot of providers. It doesn't have to be from you know LNG's service. Just being able to have that user experience. Uh, yes, that that's definitely something we we're thinking about and how, uh, how to achieve and how that could be done. Um, might be yeah, not all of, of the keys because if you phone us and wake up to just to um, do gossip stuff, then it might not be very efficient. But um, yeah, there's certainly some models that, that uh, we want to try to um, look at, yeah. Uh, I'll throw one more question, since not too many people seem to be implementing um, the Claire and Async stuff. Do you have any interest or plans for you know doing similar services or, or looking at having other applications implement and use your implementation, or is, it, is your primary goal just to like, in the school of aspects, so there's, uh, what exactly are you referring to? It's just an open question, just basically like, a lot of people are looking at mostly using LND for applications for their apps. I don't know if it's just because scale is not popular and they just don't mess with the node at all, or I don't know as much about it, but and now that uh, Blockstream has Greenlight, it's at least a solution to be able to put the keys in the user's hands. Um, granted, you have to connect it to a Blockstream service instead of your own service, but it's an open source service. Okay, then I think that Eclair is really meant for server nodes. So we, we have a lot of ways to build on top of Eclair because there's, we have a plugin system where you can interact with, uh, with Eclair. You can, you, know, you can send message to all the components of Eclair and do implement almost anything that you'd like. And you can do that in any, any JVM language, but JVM is just not popular, so we don't have many people writing plugins. But in theory, you could. But what I think is more interesting for you is that we not only have the Eclair code base for our node implementation, but we also have a Kotlin implementation of Lightning that's targeted only for wallets. And at first, our wallets were based, were completely based on Eclair, on the Scala implementation, and on a specific branch that forked off of Eclair and removed some of the stuff that was really unnecessary on wallets. But that could only run on Android what does a JVM but not on iOS. So when we wanted to ship Phoenix on iOS, we considered many things and we decided to actually rewrite a uh, Lightning implementation but optimize for wallets, like leaving many things out. And since there was a Kotlin stack that works on both Android and iOS, Kotlin multi-platform, we started based on that and it was really easy to port Scala code to Kotlin because these are two very similar languages. So it took us a, a few months, a lot of months, it took Fabrice mostly a lot of months to bootstrap this. But our goal it was to start from our architecture for Eclair and simplify it with what we learned and what we learned that we could remove for, for wallets. So I think that that's something that application developers could have a look at as well because it's quite a simple library to use. It's quite minimal. It doesn't do everything that the node needs to do because it's only for wallets. So there's, there are things that are left out. But I think it can be an interesting thing to build upon. Yeah, maybe we can do one more question, which is for LND and C Lightning. Um, you know, LND has Neutrino, and generally the, the user experience is not that great. It takes a pretty long time to do a full sync, and then you have to like resync if you haven't had your wallet online for a while. Does LND have plans for actually including, you know, not just we talked about key segregation, but what about having a node in mobile that is more performant than uh, more appropriate? So 
so, uh, so yeah, I, I, I personally never understood why neutrino should be a good fit for, for lightning nodes because uh, neutrino does away with the downloading of blocks that you're not interested in, but since most blocks nowadays contain tunnel opens, you're almost always interested in all blocks, so you're not actually saving anything uh, unless you're not verifying that the channels are being opened, that, that you accept. Um, so that caveat aside. Um, uh, C Lightning has a very powerful uh, plugin infrastructure. Uh, we do have a very modular architecture that allows you to swap out individual parts, uh, including the Bitcoin backend, um, which uh, which you can, which by default does talk to Bitcoin D, a full uh, full node, um, and, uh, and and will for, uh, fully verify uh, the entire blockchain. Um, but you can very easily swap it out for something that, that talks Neutrino, uh, something that talks to Block Explorer if, you, if you're if you so inclined to trust the Block Explorer. Or um, uh, like in the case of, uh, of Greenlight, we do have a, uh, a central Bitcoin D that uh, serves strict blocks to uh, to our clients, uh, to, to our C-Lightning nodes, and is thus much, more, uh, much quicker to actually catch up with the blockchain because, well, all of the interesting stuff of the of block we just strip out, right? Um, so this is this is the sort of customizability that I was talking about before. Uh, if you put in the time to make C Lightning your uh, uh, work for your environment, you're going to be very happy with it. Um, but we do ship with with, with defaults that there are that are sort of saying in, in that sense, um, and. I mean, there's there's many ways of, uh, of running a Bitcoin D backend uh, that could be more efficient uh, than than just processing entire blocks. Like I said, with Greenlight, we are using strip block, um, or talk to a central server that uh, serves you this this kind of information. So it very much depends on your security needs uh, about how much you trust whatever the source of uh, of this ground truth data is. Um, and by default, we do use the least amount of, uh, uh, of assumptions, but if your environment allows it, we can speed it up. And that includes mobile clients or server nodes or you name it, basically. Um, as far as I know, there is no, there are no plans to support an other kind of backend, chain backend that we currently have. Uh, so BTCD, Bitcoin D, and Neutrino. But there are still a few um, performance optimizations that can, can be done on Neutrino. So um, yeah, it just needs uh, a bit more, more love. We could do some preloading of block headers, um, uh, optimization with the database, because it's the same database technology that we use in LMD, which yeah, it's kind of has uh, come to an age. So um, I, I feel like Neutrino is still a, a viable model. Um, just need to invest maybe a bit more time what is being worked on is um, to have an alternative uh, to CMQ with Bitcoin D, so you don't need an actual CMQ connection. Um, we, we, uh, Thomas actually, uh, an external contributor is um, doing work on making it polling uh, only, so you could use your remote um, at home Bitcoin D node um, as, as an alternative if that would ever be an interesting option. Apart from that, I'm not aware of any other plans. So, so it seems to me like the specific use cases that are gravitating towards the separate implementations, like perhaps like merchants getting set up for the first time would use Greenlight and Sea Lightning, like mobile users uh, would use Eclair, um, and like developers using the API, and some of this, some exciting gaming use cases with Lightning that are using LMD. Like, how do you think? These use, case, use cases are sticking to your particular implementation, or do you just think all, your implementation can potentially do everything? Of course. <laughs> <laughs> oh. um, yeah. So, so we, we definitely have sort of a persona that we're uh, that we're aiming for. Uh, we do uh, we do have a certain type of users that we try to optimize for, and that we sort of are looking into supporting uh, as much as we, ca as we can. Of course, this persona is probably not the same for, uh, for all of us. Um, 
but there is a bit of overlap. So uh, I like the, the fact that users get to choose what, uh, what implementation they, where they want to run. Um, and depending on what their actual use case uh, is, one might be slightly better than the other, but I think that all three implementations, all four implementations, sorry, I'm one. Um, uh, uh, <laughs> no, he, he, he wasn't listening. Perhaps, <laughs> um, Kristen, you could talk also about um, the use case, given Antoine so far in the back, uh, the use case that LDK is. Yeah, so, so uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but LDK is very much, as the name suggests, a development kit uh, that aims to uh, enable app developers and, uh, and uh, well, app developers and application developers are sort of the same thing, um, but allow them to integrate Lightning into their applications uh, without forcing them to actually, uh, uh, to actually adhere to a certain set of rules. They have a very large tool set of, uh, of components that you can pick and choose from and uh, that you can use uh, to adapt to whatever your situation might be, whether that's a mobile app, whether that's a server app. Um, if I'm not mistaken, the Square Crypto app now uses LDK, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, so there, there, uh, there is a, wi a wide variety of things uh, that, uh, that you can use it for. Um, it's not. It's not a uh, a self uh, self contained node, if I'm not mistaken. But it's more aimed at developers that want to uh, want to have a tight integration with the Lightning node itself. Whereas the three implementations here are sort of uh, a uh, a software package that can be run out of the box. Some more opinionated and feature complete. Some. Uh, some that uh, give you the opportunity of customizing it and uh, sort of are less opinionated. Um, but, uh, but I think the main differentiating factor is, uh, is that LDK is a development kit that, uh, that gives you the tools and doesn't tell you how to actually do it. Well, documentation is actually quite good. <laughs> um, what was the question again? <laughs> <laughs> I think you covered it. Use cases, like the use cases, okay. gravitating tools, see lightning and LDK. Like, um, like another one, another use case that Matt talked about, I don't know how much progress you've made on this, is like an existing Bitcoin wallet integrating Lightning functionality. Mm -hmm. So like a Bitcoin on-chain wallet coming and using the LDK and bringing Lightning functionality into that wallet. That sounds really cool, but also hard. I don't know if any progress has been made on that. Um, there is a talk on it, not yet a conference. Okay, we'll hear more on the conference about that. Uh, but Bastion, uh, use case. Yeah. I think that, as, as Tom put it, it's really confusing is that we have two very different personas and only one is speaking. People think people think async is the mobile persona, whereas our first persona is actually a big, big nodes, big reliable routing and merchant nodes. That, that has been at our, our first focus. But we have also embraced a different persona of working on mobile and our probably mistake was to name our first wallet the same thing as our nodes so people only remember, people thought we were only doing that wallet part. And the reason we did that is that because we really wanted to understand the whole experience of using Lightning and we thought that using Lightning for everyone would not go through running your own node. We wanted to understand what pain points people on a mobile phone would have when using Lightning because you just don't have the same environment at all as when you're running a node in a data center or even, at, or even at home. So that's why we embraced this second persona of doing mobile wallets to see what we needed to fix at the spec level and implementation le level for the routing nodes for lighting to work end to end from a user on a mobile phone to someone that's paying. So we, we really have these two personas and we're trying to separate them a bit more by having our wallet implementation be different from our Server node implementation, but yeah, don't don't think we're only doing mobile. So uh, what what you're saying is basically Amazon would choose Eclair to accept payments. Yeah, probably. <laughs> um, I, I'm not sure what persona I would uh, strive to own. The only then um, maybe the developers themselves, so that we have an. Uh, batteries included experience for the developer that's so that they can choose what their per persona they want to serve I mean um, that I mean yeah it's we have a lot of features
pictures and um, it's everything in a, in a single binary. So we're also trying to unbundle some things so developers can have a more uh, configurable um, experience. Um, yeah, I, I think we, we have something for, for everyone almost though. Um, and we, we also have some quite big nodes running MLP, but um, yeah, I, I wouldn't say that the, the like largest nodes such as, as yours is, is our main goal, but uh, we definitely want to get there uh, as well. So um, and we were just a bit limited, uh, uh, limited by the, this database. We don't have uh, replication built in like just yet, but we want to go to PostgreSQL uh, uh, and uh, doing a lot of work there. So we can also cover this persona. So yeah, I, I guess we kind of want to serve every, everyone and anyone. I, I guess while, while everybody is trying to cut out their own niche, uh, there is friendly competition and trying to give users the options here. Uh, so we're, we're not going to limit ourselves to just one persona or another. Uh, and, and you will be the ones profiting from it. If there was one question back there. Shut up. <laughs> hey, thanks. Uh, so, I've been in the Lightning space for a while, and I'm very invested in, like, you know, users using mobile wallets. And uh, this is really a question for uh, Eclair, because I, in, my, in my opinion, I think the Eclair uh, wallet on Android is one of the best mobile wallets, um, if not the best, right? And especially for the UX and you know reliability. So my question is, you know, it's 2022. I recently moved over to an iPhone, and there is no or very, or very few uh, non-custodial uh, Lightning clients available. And my, my real question is, what is what is the biggest like thing kind of in the way right now for uh, greater mobile wallet adoption and creation? So what are y'all's opinions on that? Apple. <laughs> <laughs> I think you mean a mobile wallet for someone who understands the technical detail and wants to manage the technical details, right? Someone who wants to see the channels. Because what, what, what the approach we've taken with Phoenix is different from the approach we've taken with Vector Mobile. Our approach with Vector Mobile was to make a wallet that anyone could use, but we failed because it shows, because lighting is complicated when you have to manage your channels and you don't even understand why we cannot tell you exactly how much you are able to send because yeah, channels, it's, complica it's complicated. So we started again from scratch with Phoenix because our goal was anyone, anyone who doesn't, have, who doesn't care that it's not on-chain Bitcoin, who just wants something that sends payments like Lydia and just works. So if you want that, we already have it with Phoenix and Breeze and other wallets are doing the same kind of thing. If you want something that's more expert, that shows you, that gives you control over channel management, I don't know if you should, may, maybe what you should look for is more of a remote control over your node at home. If, because if you are at that level of technicality, maybe you you want to have your node at home, at home and control everything. Other than that, I think the libraries are getting mature enough so that these wallets would emerge if there's a dem demand, but I'm not sure there's such a big demand for people who don't run a node at home, but want a wallet that gives them full control over the channels. I don't know, but if that demand is there, the tools are starting to emerge and libraries are starting to emerge for people to build those wallets. I think channels, it's complicated. It should, load, should be lightning slogan, actually. <laughs> Okay, so before we move on to the network as a whole and spec stuff, um, anything to add on like priorities for your implementation in the coming year? Um, I suppose it kind of links into the anti-sales pitch, but anything, anything in addition that, that you want to be focusing on this year for, for my implementation? Yeah, we, we certainly have identified a couple of, of, of gaps that we, uh, that we have had uh, in, the, in the past. Uh, including, for example, uh, giving uh, giving users uh, more tools uh, to basically make sea lighting the, uh, the work for themselves, uh, be more opinionated, give them uh, give them something to start with, um, and basically the first step uh, to uh, to this end is going to be uh, we are building a gRPC interface 
uh, with mutual TLS authentication uh, to allow people to talk to their nodes. That has been a big gap in the past where we were hoping that users would come and, uh, and tell us how they expect to run, uh, to, to work with C writing. Um, and gRPC is definitely the, the, the winner there. Um, we are also working on a couple of uh, long requested features um, that I might not want to reveal just now. Um, but uh, you're not going to be limited to one, one channel per peer much longer. Um, and uh, we are going to going to work uh, work much uh, much more with the specification effort to uh, to bring some of the features that we have implemented, standardize them, and make them more widely available. That includes our dual funding approach. That includes our splicing proposals. That includes uh, the liquidity ads that we uh, that we had, and hopefully we will be able to standardize them to make them much more widely accessible um, by basically removing the block, uh, blockers that have, uh, have been there so far for, uh, for the specification. Um, I think that's mostly it, yeah. And hopefully Greenlight will work out and uh, you, will see, uh, you will see that how we can take the learnings we took from Greenlight and apply them back into the open source sea lighting project and make uh, sea lighting so much more accessible and so much uh, easier to work with. So on the VXR side, our, I'd say that our first focus is going to be continuing to work on security, reliability, and making payments work better, like improving payments. And that's just the only thing that Lightning needs to do and needs to do well, is that your payments must work, be fast, and be reliable. So there are still a lot of things to do. We, there are big spec changes that have help Lightning get better, but they need a lot of implementation love. They, they, are, they, they create a lot of details that make it hard and that can be improved. Also, there are a lot of spec proposals that will really help Lightning get better as a whole. The three that Christian mentioned, we are actively trying to implement them and we want to ship them this year. And there are also other proposals that some of them that we push for one and that we hope to see other implementations add, like trampoline and route blinding. Route blinding is already in C-Lightning because it's a dependency for authors and onion messages and I think it's really good for privacy. So yeah, Rusty will, yeah, tell tell Rusty if you didn't mention authors. Ah. <laughs> so yeah, better payments, better security, better privacy, and better reliability. And there are all of these spec proposals, I think, all help in a way to get to that end goal where all of these aspects are better. Yeah, uh, our main focus is, is of course also uh, stability um, and scalability and also reliability. Um, payment failures are, are never fun. Uh, these are yeah the, the biggest thing to, to look at because if we want to get lightning in as many hands as possible, then we will experience these scaling um, issues and that's that's um, currently one of the bigger things we, we are uh, focused on and then uh, next step will be taproot first on, on the wallet level of course also on the spec level uh, so we, we we want to push forward the, everything that's needed to get like the um, lightning onboarded onto taproot but also in our uh, products and services so that with loot and pool we can actually take advantage of the, some of the privacy and some of these um, like just scalability things. And then um, I personally think that we should um, look, take a close look at some of the privacy features such as route lining and um, parts of, of what's uh, proposed in offers or um, yeah, there's, there's some discussion, but yeah, I think we should also um, uh, tag along there or yeah, do more on, on that side. Cool. Um, so that was the implementations. We'll move on to the network as a whole now. I thought we'd start with security. Um, so, so you can you can give me your view on whether this is a good split. But 
like I kind of see three security vectors here. There's kind of like the DOS vector, there's the like uh, interaction with the P2P left layer of Bitcoin itself. Um, and then there's just bugs that crop up. Um, <laughs> so, so perhaps we'll start with Christian on like the history so far on the Lightning Network of bugs that have cropped up. The most serious one that I remember is the one where uh, you would be tricked into yeah, being bugs. into a channel without actually committing any funds on chain. That seems like a scary bug. Um, Okay, Christian can't remember that one. So it wasn't that bad. No, I, I, I have a tendency of not remembering these kind of things. Um, but you seem to remember much yeah, better. Yeah. So, so let's let's start. With the, right. we haven't got enough money. Yeah, this was bad. Let's let's start with the bugs that people can remember, um, and then we'll go on to those other two categories. So I think that yeah, the only I guess this one to really remember, and it was quite bad. But the good thing is that. It was easy to check if you've been attacked, and no one lost. I think that no one lost funds in this because it was fixed quickly, and people we were we were lucky enough that we're at a stage where it's early enough that people do the upgrades because there are so many things that are getting better in every new version of implementations that people do upgrade, so it helps us ship uh, bug fixes quickly. But yeah, where the, the process to find this kind of issue is just that we need to have more people continually testing these things. We need to have more people with an adversarial thinking, trying to probe the implementations, trying to run attacks on the existing nodes, uh, on rec tests or something else. And yeah, there, there, there's a big effort of a red team that needs to, that needs to happen more. We're, we're doing it all the time, but it would be good if all of the people outside of the main teams who are doing it as well because it would be valuable and it would bring new ideas like researchers sometimes are trying to probe the network but mostly at the theoretical level right now doing it more practical and uh, hands-on would help a lot so I hope to see more of that yeah I guess this this gets us a bit into the open source and security dilemma um, we work in the open uh, you can't see every change that we do and that puts us in a situation where we sometimes have to sort of hide a bug fix from you that might otherwise be, uh, be exploited by somebody that, uh, that knows about this issue. Um, so it's, it's very hard for us to sort of fix issues and tell you right away uh, about it because, well, that could expose others in the network about the risk. So when we tell you to update, please do so. <laughs> when we ask you twice, do so twice. Um, yeah, uh, that, that bug you mentioned was, was one of the bigger that affected all of us. Um, okay. Yeah, LMB has had um, a few bugs as well that uh, the other transactions weren't affected by. So um, I think we had one with uh, the signature with the low S where yeah, someone could, could produce a signature that um, you would think it was okay, but the network wouldn't. Um, that was, was a, a while ago. And then of course, um, uh, bugs that are just um, affecting users with maybe a crash or um, uh, incompatibility with the lightning or stuff like that we had, but um, yeah, that's why also we want to put more focus on, on stability and reliability. Okay, cool. Um, so then the next category is we'll probably go for the last one for this one is the like mempool replaceable transactions. Perhaps you can talk about that uh, very long PR you did uh, implementing replaceable transactions in Eclair and some of the challenges of interacting with mempool blocks from core. Yeah, okay, so I don't know how well you know the technicalities of lightning, but there's a big change that we made recent, recently, like almost a year ago, but it took so much time to really get to production, which is called anchor outputs, where we change, we made quite a small but fundamental change in how we use channel. Before that, 
you had to choose the fee rate of your channel transactions beforehand and sign for that and then you couldn't change it. So that means you had to predict the future fee rate for when that channel would close. And if you guess wrong, then you were screwed. So that was bad. Now with Anchor Hot Boots, you can actually set the fee rate when the channel closes, when you actually need it. So you don't have this issue anymore, but you run into other issues because yes, you can set the fee rate of your transactions when you broadcast them, but there are still quirks about how the Bitcoin P2P layer will relay transactions and let you bump the fees of transactions. That doesn't guarantee that you will be able to get these transactions to a miner and get them confirmed. And if you don't get them confirmed before a specific time lock, then you are exposed to attacks by a malicious actor. So we have definitely improved one thing, but we have shifted complexity at another layer and, there's, and we have to deal with that complexity now. We have to make it better and this is not an easy task because this is a very, very hard, subtle issue that touches many aspects of uh, Bitcoin and Lightning networks. So this isn't easy to fix, and, but that's something that we really need to do and if you, if you want to make it much better security-wise. But it's getting better. We are working for, uh, towards it and I think we will be in a good state in the end. But there, there's still a lot of work to do. I guess, I guess the concern is like, so with, with the bugs, like the first category, like you can solve those problems, right? Like to identify when you squash those bugs. Like this one seems like a long-term one where we can kind of incrementally make progress and make it more secure, but like there's no hallelujah moment where it's like, oh, this bug is fixed. In fact, it goes with the basic Lightning starts from a statement that may or may not be true, that you are able to get transactions confirmed in a specific uh, time, uh, time period. If you, if you cannot guarantee that, you cannot guarantee fund safety. And that is actually not always that easy to guarantee. In very high fee environments, where the mempool is, is very congested, it may cost you a lot to be able to guarantee that security. And we want to find the right trade-off where it doesn't cost you too much, but you're still completely secure. And it's it's a hard trade-off to find. <laughs> yeah, I guess uh, it, it's, it's as much a learning experience for us as it's a learning experience for Bitcoin Core, uh, Bitcoin uh, peer, the peer-to-peer -peer layer. And that's that's what actually makes this exciting, right? This is, this is very much a research in progress kind of thing. Uh, and uh, that's that's always what, what excited me and what got me uh, to, to wake up in the morning and just cool. Agreed. Uh, so we're, we're all geeks after all. <laughs> so I found a question on this. I will open up to the audience if they have any serious questions. Um, so I looked up the stats from Clark Moody. There's 3,500 Bitcoin on Lightning Network that we know publicly. It's about 130 million. US dollars, um, does that scare you? Is that about right? Like, if it was a billion, would you be scared? 10 billion? Any, any thoughts on that amount on the Lightning Network now? I mean, uh, I would be lying if, if I were saying that this is not a scary amount of money. Uh, it definitely is a huge, huge sort of uh, commitment that people, a lot of trust that people put into our code. And we do our best to to, uh, to rise up to that uh, to that trust. Um, that being said, we we are also learning at the same time as as many of you are uh, while operating the Lightning Node. And the more you can tell us about your experiences while operating Lightning, uh, the better we can uh, we can help you make it more secure, uh, easier to use, and uh, more private to use as well. Um, so we depend very much on your feedback, just as much as you depend on our code, basically. Okay. Um, any questions from the audience on security? Yeah. Uh, We 
we're not pointing fingers. Um, <laughs> so when, when breaking interoperability, you always have two sides, right? You have one, uh, you have one side that, uh, that has performed some changes. The other side has, uh, has sort of, uh, is, is, now, uh, is now no longer compatible with it. Uh, it is sometimes really hard to figure out which one is the wrong one. Uh, the one that has changed might have just addressed a, uh, a bug that the other one hasn't addressed yet. Um, so it's very much up to the spec effort to, uh, to say, okay, this is the right behavior, this one isn't. Um, and that sometimes is, uh, is an after the fact issue, right? Um, the spec sometimes gives a bit of leeway that, that allows you to interpret some parts of the specification in a certain way and uh, without clarifying comments of which one is the intended uh, uh, behavior, uh, you can't really assign blame to, to either of them. Um, so it might, it might sometimes be the specification that is just underspecified uh, causing these kinds of issues. Uh, I remember just recently, Rosby reached out uh, to ask whether, uh, whether the way that we interpreted one sentence in the specification was the same way that he interpreted that one sentence in the specification. Uh, and it turns out to be different. Now, is it, is it L&D that, that interpreted it wrong, or was it us who interpreted it wrong? There is no right or wrong in this case. And it's up to us to come back to the table uh, and clarify what the right interpretation is. And that is the vast majority of these kinds of, uh, uh, of incompatibilities, I would say. How much longer can we have bolts without version numbers associated with them? So if, if we want to say we're bolt whatever compliant, kind of amorphous, right? We're, yeah. we're changing it and modifying it. Uh, it seems really prudent for us to start versioning bolts to say, okay, you know, uh, Eclair, LND, C Lightning, you know, whatever releases bolt, you know, 2.5 compatible or whatever. Um, what benefits do you see to that? Uh, what potential downsides? It would be really convenient, but it's really hard to achieve because this would really require central planning of this feature will make it into the 2.0 release, and all of, all of the features that we are adding to the spec are things that require months of work for each implementation. So to have everyone commit to say, yes, I will implement this thing before this other one and before this other one, which is already a one year span with all the unknowns that can happen in a year, it's really hard to get because this is decentralized development. So that, that's something we'd really like to get. But there are so many different things that we want to work on and people assign each implementation as, assigns different priorities to it. And I think that part is healthy. That it's really hard to say this is going to be version 1.0, 1.1, 1.2. .1 so I, I used to think that we really needed to do that. I don't think that anymore. Yep. Yeah, so, so, so we actually tagged uh, version 1.0 at some point. Uh, it was sort of the, uh, the, low, uh, the lowest common denominator uh, among all of, of the implementations. And sort of this, this was to signal that, that we have all achieved a certain, a certain amount of maturity. Um, but very early on, we decided on having a, having a specification be a living document. And that also means that it, it, it is evolving over time. Um, maybe we will end up with a version 1.1 at some point that sort of again uh, uh, declares a level playing field among all of the implementations, uh, with some implementations building, uh, adding optional features and some of them deciding that it's not, uh, it's not the way they want to go. Um, but it, it is very much in, in, in the nature of the Lightning specification to always have stuff in flight, always have multiple things in flight, and uh, they're, they're not being as much comparability as it could be maybe if we were to have a more uh, RFC-like uh, process, for example, where you can say, okay, I implemented RFC 1, you implemented RFC 2, and then, then you sort of build up the specification by picking and choosing which part of the specification 
but that was that was very much a, a choice early on to have this be a living document that evolves over time and uh, and has as much flexibility as possible built into it. And one thing I would like to add to that is that the main issue is that right now we've only been adding stuff. So we are at the point where we added a lot of stuff, but we are starting to actually remove the old stuff. And that, that's when it gets better, when we are able to remove the old stuff. That when there are two things, one modern thing, one legacy thing, and everyone now supports the modern thing, and we start removing the old things from the spec, it helps, so the spec gets better, gets smaller, gets easier, and Rusty has started doing that by deprecating one uh, thing recently, I think a week ago, and I'm hoping that we'll, able, we'll be able to deprecate some other things and remove things, remove the old things from the spec. So, I know it's technically legal and everything, but um, probing feels like it's like eBay, and is there, is there any plans So um, I don't like that characterization of probing being dodgy or anything, uh, because I like to do it. Um, <laughs> so, 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 so just, just, just for context, probing is basically sending out a payment that is uh, that is already destined to fail, but along the way you learn a lot about how the liquidity is distributed in the network, and uh, some fear that it might be uh, abused to sort of learn where payments are going in, uh, in the network by very precisely sort of figuring out how much capacity is in, the, uh, in those channels and which side. And when then there is a change, you can basically see, okay, there's 13 Satoshis uh, that were removed there and 13 Satoshis removed there. So those two changes might be related. Um, it is very hard to get to that level of pre uh, precision and we are adding randomness to prevent you from doing that. Um, so the main attack vector is pretty much mitigated at, the, uh, at this point in time. Um, it also takes quite a bit of time to actually get to that precision even if you weren't uh, randomizing. So uh, you always have a very fuzzy view even if you are very good at, uh, at probing. Um, so much for probing as an attack. Uh, when it comes to the upsides of probing, probing actually does, uh, uh, does tell you a lot of, uh, uh, about the liquidity in the network. So if you probe your surroundings and uh, before you actually start a payment, you can be relatively certain that, uh, that your view of the network is up to date. And so you can skip a lot, of, uh, a lot of failed payment attempts that you'd otherwise have to do in order to learn that, uh, that information. Um, it also provides cover traffic for other payments. Uh, so when you perform payments, you are causing traffic in the network. So a passive observer in the network would have a very hard time to say, uh, say, okay, this is a this is a real payment going through, and no, this is a this is a, uh, this is actually just a probe going through. Um, so in my opinion, probing does add value. Uh, it adds. It doesn't remove as much privacy as, as people fear it does. And on the other hand, it adds uh, to the chance of you actually succeeding your payments and to you, uh, to you actually providing cover traffic for people that might need it. Um, so I pretty much like probing, yeah, no, to be honest. I, I was less worried about the privacy kind of side of it, more that it's about 95% So, so, so the, the one downside I can see uh, with, with a huge amount of, uh, uh, of probes going through a node is that it may end up loading your database. Uh, so every time we, uh, we add or remove an HTLC to a channel, we have to flush that to disk, otherwise we, we might incur uh, uh, in, in, in losses there. Uh, so there is work you have to do even for probes um, but uh, but we, the, there are ways we could replace those probes with more lightweight probes um, that do not have this uh, this uh, property. So you could uh, you could have these lightweight probes that are very lightweight, don't add to your uh, to your database, but still give you 
some information about how the liquidity is, uh, is stored, uh, how the liquidity situation is in parts of the network, uh, and provide that kind of cover traffic. Um, so it's not exactly free because yes, you are storing a couple of bytes for each for, uh, for each failed probe, uh, and over time that might accumulate. But I think in, uh, in in many cases the upsides outweigh the downsides. Cool. Okay. Oh, that's it. Yeah. No. Okay. Yeah, apparently I'm the only one probing. So yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, sorry for those extra bytes. <laughs> I'll, I'll buy you a USB stick. Okay. So we've left the slight controversy until the end. Um, <laughs> so the spec process and the box. Um, Alex Bosler uh, put the cat mark submissions with a few co few comments in an email that was shared on Twitter. I read out a couple of the quotes. Uh, obviously, he's not a fan of box file, but there was there were some specific comments on the box process itself. Well, um, I'm not a fan of Alex, but that's fair. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Obviously, uh, to clarify, um, Alex is speaking for himself, he's not speaking for like months. Uh, I think most people can argue to clarify that, so it's just his personal opinion. But um, a couple of quotes, the way this box is standardized is arbitrary, um, and if your side produces lightning software that only one or two percent of the network uses, you still get to set the standard for the remaining 98 or 99 percent. I guess, like with any spec process or any standardization process, there's always going to be these tensions. Um, like I'm not, I haven't followed any others, so this is like quite new to me. Can we be quiet on that, please? Um, so, like obviously, with different priorities and like different business models and different wishes for the direction in which the spec goes, I think like it's almost inevitable there's going to be these tensions. Um, but yeah, thoughts. So, firstly, thoughts on Alex's comments. Thoughts on how the spec process has evolved. Um, and like, is there is there anything we can improve, or is is this just an inevitable side effect of having a standardization process with lots of different players with lots of different competing interests? Uh, so yeah, I I, I think that, that those are very strong statements from from someone who has never participated in a single spec meeting. Um, I think, as you rightly pointed out, there is uh, there is a, a bit of contention in the spec, uh, spec process, but that's on, by design. Uh, if uh, if one implementation we're able to sort of dictate what the, what the entire network looks like, we would end up with a very myopic view of what the network uh, could be, and we wouldn't be able to serve all of the different use cases that we are serving. Um, and so, yes, sometimes the spec process is frustrating. I totally agree with that. And we certainly have different views of, uh, of what the network should look like. Um, but by, uh, by, uh, I think by this thesis, antithesis, and synthesis uh, process, we come up with a system that is much more, uh, much more able to serve our users than if one implementation were to go it alone. Uh, the 1% uh, comment. I wanted to address the frustration about the spec. Yes, it is frustrating. For example, personally, I opened my first big spec PR in 2019. It was Trampolin, and I was hoping that this would get accepted in six months because, yeah, this takes a long time, so six months should be great. So in 2021, I opened, I just closed it to open the 2021 edition of Trampoline, saying, oh, this time, in three months, everyone says they will implement it, so in three months, we'll have it, and it's still there. But it's okay. And if in the end, we get something better, and between the 2019 edition and the 2021 edition, I've already improved some stuff. Some stuff has, has changed based, based on feedback based on things that we learned running this in one of our wallets. So if, in, if, it, if this is what it takes for the end result to be good, I'm okay with it. We're not in a rush here. The, we are in, in this for the long goal, so I think that's 
the mindset you should have when you approach a spec process. You, you should not aim for results. You should not aim for merges. You should aim for a learning path. A learning path and getting in the end to something that many people contributed to and that in the end is really good for your users and good for the networks. <coughs> if you're ready to wait, I think this is a good process, but yeah, it is frustrating and it is hard sometimes, but I think it's a good thing. Yeah, um, I personally don't work on the spec, so I don't feel qualified to, to, to give an answer. I just wanted to add that I don't necessarily agree with um, all the points that Alex mentioned, and I definitely would have said it in a different way as well. Um, yeah, it, it, it's, um, I just hope that the, the, the lack of resources to work on the spec um, sometimes is interpreted as us blocking stuff, which is not, not the intention or not, not, um, yeah, not, not our goal, uh, of course. So um, it, it's just, yeah, we want to put in more work to the spec. So uh, I hope we'll improve there. But um, yeah, it's an interesting uh, thing to observe how, how, does <laughs> how that frustration sometimes comes to the surface. And uh, yeah. yeah so thank you for all the work you do on the spec. <laughs> I need to pick up as well, so uh, I'll do my best. Yeah, there's also two, two things that I want to mention is that, of course, yeah, the spec takes a long time. This is this takes time that you could spend doing support for your users, that you could spend doing code for your users, that you could spend doing bug fixes, and it's really hard to arbitrate. We all we all have small teams and big, a big user base, so it's really hard to find the time to do those things and to choose how to allocate your time. So it's hard to blame someone because they just don't have the time. But I think it's still an important thing to do, so you should try to find some time to allocate to it. And the other thing I wanted to say, I don't remember. So it probably wasn't that important. Trampoline. <laughs> yeah, trampoline. <laughs> oh yes, I remember. <laughs> <laughs> I really hope people don't think the spec is an ivory tower kind of thing where, oh, these guys are doing the spec and it's all complicated and oh I cannot participate not at all you you should come you should you should learn you should listen you should ask questions and you should just propose things there's it's okay and it's okay to it's okay to fail in public that, that that's a good thing actually it's okay to embarrass yourself because you proposed something in public and it was completely wrong <coughs> I'm doing it recently with all these RBF things on Bitcoin core and thinking that, oh, but why can't we do that? Wouldn't that work? And then, oh, no, it's completely dumb because yeah, there are a lot of things I don't know. And that's how you learn, and it's okay. You just need to not have too much of an ego, but don't. no one will judge you for trying something and learning that there were things that you didn't know. It, this is a really complex project, so don't be afraid to just come in and say things, and maybe you'll be wrong, but that's how you learn. There's no ivory tower, and we are welcoming all contributions. What is the actual problem with implementations in the spec and the treating what you never, in the play you never like competition? In other words, you don't need unanimous consensus like you do with a base layer. And in, in the end, you can't even actually achieve it in the Lightning Network because you already, right now, don't have completely compatible specs with different implementations. So what's the actual problem with, for example, like one implementation taking the risk, implementing something that they're not going to spec and seeing if it actually floats, and seeing if it sticks, and it actually brings new users, you know, new use cases to Lightning Network, and letting the other specs agree, you know, by seeing it demonstrated, and then all agreeing on how big the lowest common denominator to that spec. Like, what is the actual problem with that? There's no problem with that. So, yeah, uh, like, like Bastian just said, uh, there, there is absolutely no problem in, uh, in implementations, uh, trying out experimental uh, things. That's very, uh, very much welcome. Uh, back in, was it 2016 already? Yeah, 2016, we, uh, we came from three different directions and we decided to basically join all of, the, uh, all of the things that we learned during this initial experimental phase into a single specification so that we could collaborate um, and uh, that, that we could interoperate. Um, and so 
this experimental phase must always be followed up by a, uh, a proposal that is introspectable by everybody else and that can be, uh, can be implemented by everybody else. Uh, sometimes that formal proposal is, uh, is missing and that prevents the other implementations from basically giving their own review uh, uh, on, the, on that feature. And like I said, this review is very important to actually make sure that it works for everybody and that, is, uh, that it is the best we can make it. So uh, would you, if you say that's where the tension is coming from then? With like, I know that there's some arguing between like authors and AMP and you can grab L and UI around. You have a lot of different like payment methods you can implement here. So where is the, the drama at all? There seems to be some sort of, some form of drama, you know, emerging. Yeah. Like so what what is it? Is it just that the people that are trying to read by implementation are not going back and making specs? Or so so there so just for your answer, just to be clear, like the, like there has to be two implementations to implement it. Like that's arbitrary. But, but if you don't do that, and one implementation implements it, like they're attempting like to set the standard, and then someone comes six months why later not? and goes, like you've made, you've made, is, why is that you've made lots of mistakes all over the place, like this is a bad design decision, this is a bad design decision, but because it's out there in the network, then so it's it's bad, it only if it fails. It's, you know, it's a subjective thing to say it's bad if only one does it, if it succeeds, right, and if it's effective. So, so very concretely, uh, uh, one uh, one of the cases that comes to mind is uh, is basically uh, a pending formal proposal that was done by one team uh, that has been discussed for several months uh, before, and suddenly out of the blue comes a, a kind of proposal that does not have a formal write up, that is only implemented in one code base, and uh, that is being used to uh, to hold up the process on the uh, on the formal proposal. Uh, without uh, without additional uh, explanation why this should be preferred over the formal proposal or why there isn't a formal proposal. So there is a bit of tension there uh, that, uh, uh, that that yeah. progress was held up by uh, by basically a bad faith argument in this case. Uh, where I think compatibility is inevitable though in some features, right? Like, I believe PTLC channels are compatible with what? What, what, one thing is on incompatibility, the other one is holding up the spec. Yeah. Holding up everybody else to catch up to the full feature set that you are building into your own implementation. That's what, uh, what some people are, uh, uh, are arguing against. And of course every implementation, if they wanted to, could have their own network of that implementation. Right? So like, they're free to do that, but the whole point of the spec process is to try and get all the implementations when they implement something compatible on that feature. Um, but they're free to set up a new network and be completely independent of like the bulk compliant network. I don't make an implementation, so you don't have to worry about me. <laughs> I just feel like it's a bit idealistic and that the competition could result in even uh, even more iteration and even more, you know, faster evolution of the network than the spec process will. That's that's definitely a fair argument. Uh, that's that's not uh, what I'm arguing against. Uh, but like like the name Net Lightning Network uh, suggests, uh, it very much profits from the network effects that we get by actually being compatible, by being able to interoperate, and by uh, by enabling all implementations to play on a level uh, level playing field. Uh, if uh, if that last part sounds like fairness, which is not really a competitive aspect. In other words, like if one if one implementation led the whole spec. Not you know just incidentally it doesn't have to be by tyranny they just they, in other words they said we know the way we, we know this design to succeed and they were right and it brought a million users to lightning the other specs would have to go in line but we would have a million users instead of you know x thousand and so uh, so so that's why we still have internet explorer then I don't know I, I don't think it's the same thing because you don't need total compatibility you need you just need a minimum some basic features that work in all implementations, you're okay. But if there's some new spec thing that isn't in all of them that actually brings all the people, like it would become evident, wouldn't it? That that assumes that the back uh, the, that the new features are actually backwards compatible and do not benefit from a wider uh, wider part of the network actually implementing it. I don't want to keep arguing about this. I'll say one last thing. Backwards compatible with like ten thousand users compared to a hundred thousand.
left to justify even if, if it's useful, people will use it, right? Well, they, they can, yes, but but <laughs> then then you shouldn't be uh, be pretending that uh, that you are part of an open source community that is collaborative uh, collaborating on a specification. Well, open source. Oh, move on, move yeah. on. Yeah. Yeah. We have got one left. <laughs> so just a couple of things. So obviously, uh, there's conflicting opinions on Bob 12. Um, well, I think a lot of people support Bob 12. There's, there's a couple of, of oppositions, but it's it's quite a new proposal. So let's let's talk about a couple of proposals that have been like stuck for at least like a year or two. Like you mentioned, uh, you mentioned your proposal. There's also like dual funding um, and liquidity ads that Lisa Lisa's frustrated about like lack of progress on. Um, perhaps we can talk about like what's holding up these. Is it like business models? Is it like uh, proprietary services not wanting decentralized versions of that proprietary service? Is it not wanting too much to go over the Lightning Network so that it becomes like spam? Like I don't know. What, what are the considerations here that are that's holding up process in some of these proposals? I think the main consideration is developers' time. Because mostly we've done all the simple things that was Lightning 1.0, so now only remains the most the harder things that take more time to build, that take more time to review, and that involve trade-offs that are perfect solutions. So that takes time to review, that takes time for people to agree that this is the right trade-off that they want to implement in their implementation, that takes time for people to actually implement it, test compatibility, and we have I think we have a lot of proposals right now that are floating in the spec and that most of us agree that this is a good thing, this is something we want to build, but we, we just don't have the time to do everything at once, so everyone has to prioritize what they do, but I don't think any of those are really stuck. They are making progress, they are making slow progress, but all of these are, in my opinion, progressing. Yeah, so, so all, all three or four uh, proposals that you mentioned are, uh, well, trampoline isn't that big, but, uh, but dual funding is, uh, is, is quite big, uh, splicing is quite big, uh, liquidity ads is quite big, offers is quite big, and so it, it, it's already natural that, uh, natural that uh, it takes time to, to basically review them, sort of hammer out all of the fine detail, uh, details, and that, that requires setting aside resources to do so, and we're all small teams, so uh, so it basically comes down to the priorities of the individual team. How much, how much you want to dedicate to the specification effort? Um, C Lightning has always made uh, made an effort to uh, to have all of its developers on on the specification uh, process as well, as have other teams as, uh, as well. But it's it's a small community and uh, and sometimes get frustrated if our own spe uh, pet project doesn't make uh, make it through the process as quickly as we would like it to be. Uh, so yeah, any audience questions on the spec process? No? Okay, so we'll end then with like, when you dream about what the Lightning Network looks like in five years, uh, like, what, what does that look like? I know Christian, you previously talked about channel factories, but like everything seems, as the months go on, everything seems so further away, right? Like the more the more work you do or the more progress you make, the further you are away from it, almost seems like. Certainly with like Taproot, uh, perhaps Oliver can talk about some of the stuff that he hopes to get with like Taproot or Lightning. But uh, yeah, like what, what do you hope to get, uh, in which direction? you want to go in for the next few years? So uh, maybe I can say that five years ago I would not have expected to be here. Uh, we've, th this, this network has grown much, much quicker than I thought it would. Uh, it's, uh, it's been much more successful than I thought it would. Um, it has surpassed my, my sort of wildest expectations, uh, which probably should give you an idea of how badly I am at estimating the future. Um, so you shouldn't ask me about predictions. Um, I think 
what uh, what the Lightning Network will look like in five years doesn't really depend on what we think is the right way to go. Uh, there are applications out there we Lightning spec developers cannot imagine. We're simply way too deep in the process to take those long shots. Um, and I, I'm always amazed about, uh, about what applications the users are building on top of Lightning. And, uh, and it's, uh, it's, really, it's really you guys who are going to build the big moon shots. And we're just building the basis that you can, you can start off of. So uh, I, I think that's, that's really the message here. You should, uh, you are the guys that, that are actually doing the, the innovation here. So thank you for that. Don't have anything to add, that's perfect. Yeah, I mean, I'm just gonna be bold and say I'd like to see a billion users actually, or a billion people actually using Lightning in one way or another, hopefully as non-custodial as possible, but just number of users go up. Okay, so uh, final audience questions. Uh, uh, Rene had one on Twitter. How should we proceed with the zero-based fee situation? Should LM devs do nothing? Should we have a default zero representation in the spec and or implementations? Should we deprecate the base fee? Um, any thoughts on zero-based fee? So um, since since Rene and I have, have been talking a lot about uh, about why zero-based fee is uh, is sensible uh, or why it wouldn't be. Um, I'll just I'll just add a quick summary. Uh, so zero, zero base fee is a proposal by Rene Picard uh, to remove the fixed uh, fee and make uh, uh, make the uh, the fee that every node charges to for uh, for forwarding payments just proportional to the amount that is being forwarded. It's not removing the fees; it's just removing that sort of uh, uh, initial offset. Um, and why is that important? Well, it turns out that uh, the, uh, the, the sort of computation that we do to compute an optimal route inside of the, uh, of the Lightning Network might uh, be much, much, much harder if we don't remove it um, according to his model. So um, if we were to remove the base fee, then, uh, then that would allow us to compute at optimal route, uh, routes inside of the Lightning Network with a maximum chance of succeeding in the shortest amount possible, which I mean that's 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 a huge upside. Um, the uh, the counter argument is that uh, that yes, it it is basically uh, it is a change in the protocol, and maybe we can get uh, we can get away with uh, with an approximation that might not be as optimal as uh, uh, as the uh, the optimum solution would be, but which is still pretty good. Um, as to whether we as the spec process should be dictating those rules, I don't think it's up to us to dictate anything here. Uh, we've given, uh, we've given uh, Lightning Node operators the ability to set fees however they want, and it, it, it's, up to the, uh, it's up to the operators to decide whether that, uh, that huge performance increase for, uh, for their users is worth the uh, uh, setting a, a base fee to zero, or whether they uh, they are okay with charging a bit more for the fixed work they have to do, uh, and uh, sort of having slightly worse uh, worse routing performance. Um, but as spec developers, it's always difficult to to set up defaults because defaults are sticky. And it would basically be us deciding on behalf of Lightning Node operators uh, what the path forward should be, whereas it should be much more us listening to you guys what uh, uh, what you guys want from us and uh, taking decisions according to that. Um, yeah, I uh, I um, met with uh, Rene um, uh, recently, and we we discussed this, this proposal again, and we. Kind of have a plan how we could um, integrate uh, some kind of proof concept into into LMD that can work around some of the uh, issues with the, the base fee just to get the sense of how how um, how does this compute how fast is it compared to um, normal path binding and and how.
how much better could it be? So we can actually run some numbers, do some tests, get some get some real uh, real world comparison, real world numbers, which is what I thought was was a bit lacking before to have actual actual results being shown. So um, yeah, my my goal is to to give it a shot to implement something very naive and very uh, stupid based on his paper and see where it goes. But um, yeah, it might take some time, but I'm curious to see what yeah what, what comes out of that. So uh, a, a, as you can see, many of our uh, answers basically come down to us being very few people working on the specification. And I think all three or four teams are currently looking for, uh, for help there. So if you or somebody you know is interested in, uh, in joining the lightning effort, I think we all are hiring. Yeah, definitely. Uh, so definitely. Uh, raise your hand, join the ranks, and we could definitely use your help. Cool. So, any final audience questions? Nope. Uh, the base chain always finds incentive compatible or agree to something that's good for you, that's also good for network, and vice versa. In, in Lightning, there's some deviations from that, but for example, if you look at liquidity for a long time ago, you pay for that, so if you use the channel down for a while, that's the same process for a long time ago. I think it's fine for now, but for bootstrapping, you try to be kind of viewer friendly and everything and so on. Uh, but going forward, you see that uh, you know, when we get more adoption, you see that that's something that we're going to have to move away from. Um, are there any technical uh, obstacles or things like certain payments? Uh, yes. What are you doing on kind of paying for liquidity over time and not just uh, for the program? Yeah, that's a not an issue because we don't have a lot of volume, but I think it, it is an issue even if we don't have a lot of volume, but it's just that we don't have a perfect solution to that. And I don't think there is a perfect solution to that. And we we have done a lot of research. There, there has been a lot of proposals you trying different kind of things to fix it. But all of these proposals either don't completely work or work but require quite a lot of implementation changes and a network-wide upgrade, which takes time. So we are actively trying to fix this, but this is still very much in research phase, I guess. And if more people want to look at it from a research angle, that would be very much appreciated, because I think it's an interesting problem to solve and there's still some design space that hasn't been um, evaluated, but we haven't focused on implementing anything because we are not yet convinced by the solutions we found. But this is very much something that we are trying to fix in the short midterm. So I think saying that uh, that the base chain is uh, always where incentive compatible is probably also a bit of a stretch. Uh, we still disagree on whether our VF rules are incentive compatible or not, and we, we are still fighting over that. That being said, I do agree that the venues where these disagreements and the incentive incompatibilities on the base chain uh, uh, are present are m much, much fewer. That's one, because the base chain is much simpler. Um, there is much less uh, stuff that co can go wrong on Bitcoin mainnet than can go wrong in, in Lightning. So the surface where stuff can go wrong in Lightning is also much bigger. Um, and Bitcoin itself has had quite a lot more time to mature. Um, and, uh, and I've been with Bitcoin since 2009, and trust me, I've seen some shit go down. Um, and uh, so I think uh, we, shouldn't, we shouldn't set up the same sort of requirements when it comes to, uh, to, to being perfectly incentive compatible or perfectly secure, perfectly private either. Um, and, uh, and we, should, we should be able to take the time to address these issues uh, in, in a reasonable uh, way and to make those learnings and address, uh, address them as they, as they surface. Um, that being said, there are many proposals flying around. Uh, we are evaluating quite a few of them, including uh, paying per time of, uh, of funds locked up you, uh, you mentioned stockless payments, which might uh, might become a possibility with PTLCs, which might 
become impossible later with Taproot. Um, so there, there, is, there are ways we can improve, certainly now, and, uh, and I guess only the future will tell if we, uh, if we address them completely or whether we have to go over the books again and find a better solution. Um, yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Do any of you have any uh, general advice for aspiring lightning developers? Maybe a pitfall to avoid or things specifically to focus on? I guess uh, as an aspiring lightning developer, uh, you probably want to go from your own experience. Uh, go from, uh, from what, uh, what you've seen while running a lightning node yourself, whether that's for yourself or for somebody else, or trying to, to explain it to somebody else. Uh, where are your own, uh, uh, where are your own disagreements with what Lightning is nowadays? Try to bring it, uh, try to come up with a solution uh, for it. Try to propose it. It can be completely theoretical at first, or it can be, uh, can be something that you yourself build on top of Lightning. Um, that, uh, all of that is experience that, uh, that you can bring to the table that is very valuable for us uh, as implementers of, of the various uh, Lightning implementations or as, uh, as spec developers. Because that, uh, those additional views that you bring to the table uh, can inform how we can, uh, can go forward as well. Um, so my, my personal tip is uh, just, just try out uh, an implementation. Try to build something on top of it. Try make some experience with, with it. And then, uh, and then come to us and, uh, and basically say, oh, this, this, this is not how I expected it to work. Why is it, uh, how can we do it better? Wouldn't this be better? Uh, and and uh, things like that. So um, that's a very gentle approach to, uh, to, uh, to this whole topic. And uh, usually the way that, uh, that can make a permanent change in, in, in this ecosystem as well. My biggest feedback and advice on the lightning learning experience is to not try to take it all in at once. <laughs> this is a multi-year <laughs> learning process. There's a lot you have to learn. There's, this is a complex, very complex uh, subject. You have to master Bitcoin, then lightning, and it's really a huge piece with a lot of subtleties. So accept that there are many things that will not make sense for a very long time. And you have to be okay with that and just take pieces, pieces by pieces, learning some stuff, starting with some part of lightning, then mastering that part, then moving to something else. And this is going to be a long, long journey, but a really good one. So. Yeah, very, very good point. And um, just to add on to everything that you already said, is um, the, the main constraint in resources isn't that we don't have enough people creating pull requests, but we don't have enough people reviewing, testing, actually um, running stuff, making sure that, that everything, um, like new PRs are actually in the quality that, that is required to be merged. So as a new developer, if you if your first goal is to just create a PR, it might be frustrating because it might lie there for a while because nobody has time to look at it. So start by, by just testing out the PR, giving feedback, yeah, I ran this, it's cool, does it work or does work or whatever. That you learn a lot um, and also help help way more than just adding new feature that yeah might not be the, the most important thing at the moment. But yeah, yeah I think uh, Bastien said it uh, said it about half an hour ago, uh, but I think it's worth repeating. Uh, don't hesitate to ask questions. Uh, there are no dumb questions. Even the simplest of question allows us to basically shine a light on something from a different perspective. And it's something that I personally enjoy a lot to, to just walk people through the basics for more advanced features. Or uh, maybe it's, it's, it's an opportunity for me to, uh, to learn a new perspective as well. Um, and I, I think we're kind of OK. Uh, we, we, we don't fight. Um, and sometimes we have cookies. Any, any more questions? No? Okay, so we'll thank our panelists uh, and thank our sponsors, uh, Coinbase Recruiting, 
Uh, there's going to be food in the back. There's lots of drink as well. So stay around and eat some drink. Thanks a lot for coming. Uh, thank you. <laughs>